just got to finish singing the chorus when you get to How Great Thou Art. You've got to get through it and sing it with all that's in your heart. How great is our God. Good morning, everybody. It is a beautiful, beautiful morning here in the neighborhood. So I am glad to see... Oh, wrong one. I am glad to see all of you up and around and out here. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> Enjoy the while well, we got it and the pollens and everything else. <clears throat> just me asthma, folks. Just keep, you know, just keep praying. I keep breathing. All right. Good morning, Miss Betsy. I see you're the first one up there this morning with a big sunny smiley face. Good morning. Good morning. And Miss Carolyn, good morning to you. It is good to see you. And Miss Donna, it was nice seeing you yesterday. And I get to see you up here this morning. And there is Alyssa. Good morning, Miss Alyssa Bailey. It is good to have you and your fine young family. You give a shout out to Kara and to Cody and to Cam. Great, great kids, and I'm glad you are all out here. And I pray you, God is able to just really, really, really do some great things in your life. What a wonderful family. Miss Terry, got to see you yesterday too, and uh, we love you. Thank you for all that you have done and uh, helping to get things prepared for uh, uh, for well a little wedding coming up tomorrow a little private affair and and they stepped in to give a hand and a help out and that's kind of neat and there is miss ruth ann and give a shout out to kenneth this morning lena good morning to you and to rick i don't know whether Teresa's out there too but uh, it's good to see you up this morning and then my miss sherry says good morning dear brothers and sisters we have such great and mighty god yes we do let's move forward let's do our little catch up there we'll move uh i'm um, gonna expand a little bit on where we were yesterday you see after pointing out uh, uh the hypocrisy of this delegation that has come down uh, to capernaum for uh from jerusalem jesus turns his attention back to the crowd uh to just share a brief parable about what truly truly does defile a person uh it's not he says what goes into the body that defiles but it's what comes out of the heart, meaning the very core of man, that innermost man, the seat of man's personality, the will, the, the mind, the emotions, the, the, the intellect, the volition, all of that. This is, this is what defiles man. Uh, good morning, Miss Debbie. Good morning, good morning, good morning. You are here. Yay! Miss Debbie is here. Everybody give Debbie a shout out this morning. Uh, a lot of stuff going on in their world, so uh, pray for them and give a shout out, all right? All right, uh, so we talked about our life being based on truth and driven by faith and allow emotions to follow and, and catch up. Don't be emotion-driven. The problem is that uh, most people that you and I run into, and ourselves included at some point at least, are driven by our emotions. We react, and uh, instead of acting uh, based upon fact and truth, and letting that be the determiner that uh, that that we turn our volition over to, uh, we let our emotions get the better of us. We make decisions, split-second decisions, based upon what we feel or or how we feel. So so don't do that. You know, don't be emotion-driven. Be truth-based. Fact driven, fact, truth based, and faith driven. Jesus is saying in this parable that it's really an issue of the heart. Uh, I listen to Sherry when she counsels with people and and talking to people, and and she uses this constantly, and and she's absolutely spot on when she says it. You know, it it it's not what is out there. It's it's where's the heart. You know, it's a it's a matter of the heart. God knows the heart. In fact, in John chapter two, it says that there's a lot of people that believed him, but as for him, he didn't he didn't commit himself to any of them. Why? Because he knew what was in the heart of man. He knows the heart. Real problem with man is his heart, not his diet. Uh, and it's this that makes him unable to stand before God as clean and acceptable without some fairly radical heart surgery. This, of course, is the discussion that Jesus ends up having with his disciples 
when they're alone and out of earshot of the crowd. And I'm really glad they were smart enough to dump some of this when nobody else could hear. Uh, but in, in verses Mark 7, verses 17 to 19, he said, uh, uh, there it is. And when he left the crowd, left the crowd and entered the house, the disciples questioned him about the parable. Well, what have they always been taught? What was in their mindset? I mean, these were men, they, these were Jewish men who lived under the law. And they knew the law. They followed the law. They practiced the law. They knew what the ritual cleansing of the hands meant. They had been taught that touch anything unclean, you're defiled. They had been taught these from the time they were small all the time they grew up. So they had to question him and, and you know, about the parable. And he said to them, are you still lacking in understanding? You, you mean tell me you can't take all these pieces and put them together? Are you stupid? <laughs> and literally, I, I shared that with you yesterday. Do you understand? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? Because it doesn't go into the heart, into the core. It doesn't go into that inner man. It doesn't go into the heart, into the stomach, and is eliminated. Uh, we can think of the word heart as referring to, as I said, the will, and the emotions, because they're all influenced by the intellect. Or we allow our emotions to affect our intellect. Think about what we're seeing in our world today with, what, 115 different genders and, you know, I feel like a woman today, so I am a woman, or I feel like a man today, so I am a man. Uh, you know, and we can go through all of these discussions, but that's all, you know, we're, we're trying to make decisions based upon this raw emotional stuff about the that's based all in our feelings. That seems to be what be you know is the foundation. But feelings are nothing more than a vapor. Fact, truth. That's long standing. That's concrete. That's bedrock. Like the disciples, if my mind is really committed to something, it'll affect my will. Oh, by the way. If my emotions are really committed to something, it's going to affect my will as well. One's going to lead me to stable life. One's going to lead me to a unstable life. Do you get the picture? You know, you know if my decisions are, are fact-based, they're going to inform and affect my emotions. Think of the will as the flywheel. The mind gets it moving. Once it's moving, it moves the emotions. But it can work the other way as well. Uh, maybe we need to talk a little bit in the next day or so about a, a disciple's personality. What are we going to allow to influence the, the mind, the will, and the emotions? At any rate. So it all really comes down to a heart matter. Do you have a heart that is turned toward and tuned in with God? Or do you have a heart that's turned on and tuned into self? We need to guard closely the heart at all costs. Teach our children, our grandchildren, to do the same. We ended yesterday with David's words when he turned back to God after being thoroughly trapped in the quicksand of sin. And David realized this. So he asked God to cleanse his heart. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. We're going to take a little trip down the life of David for a moment and, uh, and try to help make this clear. All right, or clearer. Good morning, Miss Jessica. Give our sweet Sadie a big kiss, all right? Father, I want to thank you so much that we can come back into your word this morning, pick up where we left off, and move forward, knowing 
that you have instruction for each and every one of us. So we come and just simply ask you, as our guide, our guide into truth, that you open up the truth of your word. Let us see some things so plainly as they affect our lives, Lord, so that we might live a life that is simply tuned into you and operating on your level and not on the level of our flesh. God, we love you, and we do praise you, Lord, and we glory in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I heard somebody say one time that uh, uh, if I were to tell you that you know, in your home right now, there is the most vile things being said, that wretched, horrible, vile, vulgar things are coming, you know, are, are all around you. A lot of people say, well, you know, that's not true. Yeah, it is. Because in the airwaves, all of this stuff is out there. You know the reason that you can't hear it? Is because you don't have the radio tuned to the right channel, to the right frequency. And I think that's, that, that's a good illustration for us. God is leading us. He's guiding. He's speaking to us. We just need to make sure that our radios, if you will, are turned to the right frequency and tuned into him. All right? Now, talking about the heart. David is a man that Scripture tells us is a man after God's own heart. God's desire, God's will, God's purpose, God's character, all right? Yet David sometimes failed miserably, and we know that he sinned greatly, but still he doesn't lose that special designation that he has. Remember, in all that we've been looking at, uh, it's always coming back down to this matter of the heart. And I'm not talking about that muscle inside our chest that pumps blood. We understand that. I, I think I've made that perfectly clear. To understand why David was a man after God's, God's own heart, we need to see what characteristics he had to qualify for such an exalted description. In the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul speaks of God's feelings or desires for King David. In Acts 13 and verse 22, after removing Saul, Paul says, he made David their king. And he testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. So, the answer to why David is considered a man after God's own heart is found, you know, right there in this verse. At the, the last of that verse is David would do whatever God wanted him to do. There's your basic characteristic right there. An obvious question is how could God still call David a man after his own heart when David committed such terrible sins, those including adultery, and murder. We learn much of David's character in the book of Psalms. Because in Psalms, he really opens up, uh, you know, he, he kind of pulls the curtain back and you get to look into the very heart of David throughout the Psalms. David's life was a portrait of success and of failure. That could be any one of us, couldn't it? It's a biblical record that highlights the fact that David was far from perfect. Now, that being said, it, it gives us hope, does it not? If David wasn't perfect, we aren't either. If David was always considered a man after God's own heart, even when he slipped and fell and sinned grievously, then there's a lot we can learn from that. But what made David a cut above the rest? Well, it was his heart, it was that innermost man, the very seat of his intellect, the, uh, you know, the volition, his ability to choose to follow God regardless of, of the emotion. His heart was pointed toward God. His radio was tuned in to the right frequency.
frequency most of the time. He had a deep hunger and desire to follow God's will and do everything God wanted him to do. Oh, he was a man after God's own heart. Let's let's look at some of the characteristics in David's life. First of all, you know, notice God did not say David would uh, only do what God wanted him to do. That's right. But, you know, that characteristic, he's going to do what I want him to do. David had absolute faith in God, an unwavering faith. Part of why David was called a man after God's own heart is that he had, he had, he had this incredible faith in, in God's ability, in who God is. Nowhere in Scripture is that pointed out any better than in 1 Samuel 17, where David, as a young shepherd boy, fearlessly slays the Philistine giant, Goliath. Shortly before the duel, you know, we see direct evidence of David's faith when confronted with, with, with Saul. Saul's saying, well, here's my armor, and there's my sword, and there's my shield. And, you know, they're kind of making fun of him. And David says in verse 37 of that chapter, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. That kind of silenced the crowd. And Saul finally said to David, go, go and the Lord be with you. See, Saul didn't have a heart to follow God, do what God wanted him to do. You you remember the story. God had sent him to battle with the Amalekites and literally to destroy the Amalekites. He told them to, you know, man, woman, child, cattle, sheep, oxen, camels, everything, they were to be annihilated. Their cup of wrath was full. God said, I've given them over, you know, I've given them hundreds and hundreds of years to repent. They've refused to repent. Now judgment is coming, and I'm going to use Saul and the army of Israel to be, to execute my judgment. Well, Saul went down. He did battle. He beat the Amalekites, and uh, uh, he was supposed to come back and make offering, but he didn't. But God knew he didn't, so he sent Samuel around, you know, to to cut him off and meet him. And the minute he sees Samuel, he says, "Oh, Samuel, I'm coming back. I've just done everything God told me to do. Everything God told me to do. I killed all the Amalekites, and here, let me show you. I have King Agag over here." Let him testify. Well, there's at least one Amalekite left living, and we know there were others. But I did everything God told me to do. And good old Samuel looks at him and says, uh, well, what's the bleeding of sheep and the mooing of cows that I hear? Oh, I slaughtered all their sheep and all their cattle. I just kept the very best to give to God. Of course, in that, you know, God repents having made him king, and he loses, basically, God's blessing on his kingship, and that's going to pass to David from that moment on. Judgment has fallen on Saul. He wasn't tuned into God. He didn't do all God asked him to do. And it's there that Samuel says uh, to Saul that... uh, you heal the blood of goats and oxen. That's not what God's looking for. He's looking for a broken and a contrite heart. He's looking for a life humbled and in submission to God, willing to do what God has said. He finds that in David. David was fully aware that God was in control of his life and that he had faith that God would deliver him from impending danger. How else would one venture into a potentially fatal situation with such calm and confidence? David knew early on life that God was to be trusted and obeyed. God had delivered him from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. This young boy had had, uh, driven off both these vermin and others that had, had, had sought to attack his father's flock, and he had been faithful in his responsibility, and he had trusted in God. So we see in Scripture, David's faith pleased God, and God rewards David for his faithfulness. So let me ask, do we absolutely trust God? Do we have absolute faith 
in God? Do we believe God will do what God says he will do? And are we willing to stake our life and our reputation on that? Are we willing to do everything that God says because we trust completely in him? Also, David loved God's word, loved his precepts, loved his ordinance. This is another reason that David was a man after his own heart. He, he absolutely loved the word of God. Of the 150 Psalms in the Bible, David is credited for, for writing over half of them. Writing at various and, and uh, various times, often in, in troubling times in his life. He's running for his life in some of these. He's, 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 he's a wanted, hunted man. There's a price on his head as he writes some of this. He has a son who has uh, uh, abandoned him and, and has rebelled, rebelled against him and wants to kill him as well. And, you know, so he, he, not only in the good times did he write the Psalms, but in his lowest point. He wrote of what he was exalted and, 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 and high, you know, in his relationship, and when he was low and depressed and hiding in a cave. We find a beautiful example of this in Psalms 119 as he pours out what, what you know, his love for the word. He says, for I delight in your commands because I love them. I lift up my hands to your commands, which I love, and I meditate on your degrees. I delight in your commands, your word. What you tell me to do? I, I, I lift up my hands to your commands, which I love. I meditate on your decrees, on your word. It's not hard to see his complete adoration for the word of God. How shall a young man... He, he, he says, uh, he says you know, that we're to, to be like a tree planted by the waters. We're to meditate on his word day and night over and over and over. Look at that word. I meditate on your decrees, he says. He meditates on the statues, the decree, the, the word, the sayings of God. God granted David an understanding and wisdom through, through uh, daily meditation. He, and we would do well not only to read God's word, but to think about it all day long. Roll it over in our mind. Apply it as we go through life. See how that word that uh, God impressed upon our heart today, you know, just simply plays over and over in one scenario after another. So we do well to think about it all day long, for God loves when we think about him. Psalms 119, 2 and 3 says, Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You want to keep yourself out of trouble? Keep his statutes. See him with your whole heart. David also recognized that the best hedge that we have to avoid unholy behavior was to immerse our lives in the word and let the word penetrate our lives. In Psalms 119, verses 9 through 11, he says, how, shall, how can a young man keep his ways pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander for your commandments. Your word have I treasured, have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. Look at that verse. Take just those three verses and make them a point of meditation today and see how often you'll find occasion to put your full weight upon that word. How should a young man, an old man, a middle-aged man, a young, uh, a teenager, a, a boy, a girl, a man, a woman, keep their way pure, right, righteous, and upright by keeping it according to the word of God. With all my heart, I sought you, Lord. Because of that, don't let me wander from your commandments. Don't let me stray away from your word. Your word have I hidden in my heart, treasured in my heart, that I may not sin against you. 
keep those three verses, meditate on them, roll them around in your mind, and then every time the opportunity to wander away from the word comes up, you have that. You go back and say, no, no, I'll not wander from his commandments. I can say no to that temptation. Well, again, David was truly, truly thankful. Do you have a thankful heart? Are you grateful for all the good things? But are you also grateful for all the hard times and the hard things? David was a man after God's own heart in that he was truly, truly thankful. Psalm 26, verses 6 to 7 says, I wash my hands in innocence and I go about your altar, O Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. Boy, was he grateful. You go about your day exalting the wonder of God and thanking him and, and glorying in his provisions. Thank you for the, uh, the coolness of the day. Thank you for the warmth of the day. Thank you, Lord, for, for the ability to, uh, to work and to do. Thank you, Lord. Are we grateful? I, I always come back when I, I, I talk about gratitude in any way to T.W. Hunt's words when he was teaching in, in prayer life. And we we're in the, in the area of Thanksgiving. He said, what if what you have tomorrow depends on what you're grateful for today? And then he makes it very practical. How many of you would have uh, a plate to put your food on? Or utensils to eat them by? A cup to hold your water in? How many of us would even have the oxygen to breathe tomorrow? Because we weren't grateful for the oxygen we breathed today. What if the blessings of tomorrow was dependent on our gratitude today? Oh, I'm glad we don't have a capricious God like that. I'm glad we don't have a, uh, a fickle deity. I'm glad that his general grace is poured about upon man and we enjoy the benefits of his creation. We enjoy the benefits of oxygen and sun and water and moon and we have all these things. But, but are we grateful? Do we have a heart of gratitude? David's life was marked by seasons of great peace and prosperity as well as times of fear and despair. But yet in the midst of despair and fear, David says, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. The emphasis is on I will. I will. This is the day the Lord made. That's fact. I will rejoice and be glad in it. That's how I'm going to respond. And the key word in the middle of all that, the hinge pin, is will. I will rejoice. This is the day the Lord's made. It could be a horrible, wretched, horrible day. The world is crumbling in on my head, yet I will rejoice and be glad in it. This could be a day of ultimate blessing and wonder and, 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 and spectacular. I will rejoice. It doesn't matter what the day is like. God made it, and I will rejoice in it. Terry says, thankful for a home and a war. <laughs> <coughs> oh, I, we could, I guess, if God was that fickle, we could be sleeping on a, a cold stone in a, you know, outdoor park somewhere. But through all the seasons of David's life, he never forgot to thank the Lord for everything that he had. It is truly one of David's finest characteristics. He writes in the, the 100th Psalm, verse 4, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and bless his name. As followers of Christ Jesus, we would do well to follow David's lead in offering praise through thanksgiving to our Lord. And, Here's a biggie. David was truly, truly repentant. After he sinned, David showed the very depth of repentance. David's sin with Bathsheba is recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 through 5.
And you know the story. How he sinned against God. That chapter opens up with, at the time that the kings went out to war, David was on the roof of the palace. I want you to consider those words. At the time that the kings went out to war, David was on the roof of his palace. In other words, David wasn't where David was supposed to be. David was supposed to be out leading the troops, if you will. But he was home, comfortably sleeping in his nice warm bed, under the shelter of his nice built house, stretching out and getting his morning, you know, sun up on his roof, whatever. So he gets in trouble, first of all, because he's not where God intended him to be. One of those times in David's life. And he looks out over the parapet of his house, he looks down into the courtyard, and he sees Bathsheba bathing. Well, because he's not where God want, you know, where he was supposed to be, he left himself open to see what he shouldn't see. And when you read the story, it's not a casual glance and go, oh my goodness, and turns away. No. I mean, he's a voyeur. He sees what he sees, he likes what he sees, and he gawks at it. So he's not where he was supposed to be, so he sees what he shouldn't see, and then he lingers on what he saw that he shouldn't see. You following me? And that's not bad enough, as he's lusting after in his own heart, he decides to carry it out and do what he shouldn't do. So he wasn't where he should have been. He saw what he shouldn't see. He lingered. He he, he lingered on what what he shouldn't see until it developed into this lustful you know desire that led him to do what he shouldn't do. And that whole and, and, and then when when it comes back that uh, uh, you know she's pregnant. He decides, well, I, I, I can't have that. I gotta, I know, I'll trick your eyes. So he brings him off the battlefield with a pretense to see how the battle's going. Now, if he'd been where he's supposed to be, he'd have known that, right? And he figured you're right, go in and, uh, you know, he'd been out of war. Guy, you know, soldier comes home for, a, for leave. He's going to do what the husband's going to do. But he's an honorable man. His men are out in the field away from their family. So he sleeps out in a tent outside the city because he's an honorable man. Well, let's see, that didn't work. So he compounds it now. Not only has he tried to use trickery and conniving to cover up doing what he shouldn't have done, he now takes it one step further. And the plan is to send Uriah on a suicide mission where surely he would be killed. And that sin could be covered up. Now, I know that none of us ever try to cover up our sin. We never try to hide it, you know, in a corner someplace. We don't try to, uh, you know, ex explain it away. We, we don't do any of that. We're, we're not like David. We haven't gone as far as David's gone yet, have we? Of course, you know, that's facetious talk. Well, he doesn't get away with it because God knows what he did that he shouldn't do and he knows how he tried to cover it up and, and he knows the extent that he went to, uh, to mask what he did. He'd sinned against God and uh, when confronted by the prophet Nathan, this story means a lot to me because this is, this is the kind of story God used to break me years and years ago. In 2 Samuel 12, in verse 13, it says, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin, and you shall not die. 
But admitting our sin and asking forgiveness is the only half of the equation. The other half is repentance. And, 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 and David did that as well. We don't have time to, to, to unfold the 51st Psalm today, but we're going to open some stuff up. In Psalm 51, this great, this great prayer, plea, this cry of repentance, we, we hear from the very beginning, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your, love, your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, as David humbly comes before God, he's pleading his case based upon the nature of God, not on the goodness of man. He doesn't come and say, you know, God, I, I, I've been faithful. I, I know I falter now, but I've been, I, I, I've been faithful. I, I, I've been a good king. I've been a good leader. I just stumbled. No, he doesn't do that. He comes based upon the foundation of God's character, who God is. Have mercy on me, a God of mercy, O oh God. According to your steadfast love, you are merciful, you are loving. According to your abundant mercy, there's mercy again. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me, cleanse me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. And you'll see how this plays out tomorrow. In a message, I, I, I preached more than once. I tried to go through the 51st Psalm and lay out the wretched effects of sin upon the believer's life. Because David is a believer. So I, I take it from the standpoint of what it does to my life or your life when we jump in. I don't want to say we accidentally fall in. David made a choice, didn't he? He chose not to be out with the troops. He chose to be on his roof that day. He chose to not be where he should have been. He chose to look down and he chose to stay there and, and look until it had developed into a, a loss of water. He chose to take Bathsheba. You see, these are all choices that he made. We don't sin as a believer without making that choice to do so. But to go through the 51st Psalm and to lay out the wretched effects of sin upon a believer's life, it became one of these 10-point messages. But it can be summed up pretty succinctly, which I will try to do tomorrow. But I'd like you to turn to Psalm 51. I'd like you maybe to take time when we close out today just to read through that psalm. Familiarize yourself with it once again. And we'll pick up on that tomorrow and uh, let it unfold in our heart and life till we see and understand. Because when you do, you begin to see exactly what God's talking about, what Jesus has explained to disciples about how defilement comes from within. And you'll be able to determine and, and, and to see some things pretty blatantly. All right? So... That's going to be it for today. I pray God has kind of pulled some of the, the haze away and you see pretty clearly what it is that Jesus is saying to his disciples. We see it in the life of David and begin to apply it to our own life. Take all those little pieces. Remember that word understand? It means to put all the little pieces together. That's what we're doing, putting all the pieces in place so that you see the full picture. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you so much. I'm thankful for, Lord, each and every one of these people that are out here and are part of us this morning. Lord, with that premise in mind, I, I want to be thankful for them, Lord, because I want to be back. God, you are so good so gracious, so so loving to show us all of the pitfalls and potholes that lay before us. And know, Lord, that if we will keep our eyes on you, trusting you, you will fill in any pot, every pothole and lift up every pit and make it smooth and you'll lead us on a path today 
that we've never gone down or walked before. So we humble ourselves before you. We come, ask you, Lord, to continue to impress upon our heart the words of this lesson. To take your word and, and truly plant it deeply within our heart. To make it rich to us. That Psalm 119, 9 through 11. To make that rich in our own soul. To guide our steps through this day. Lord, give us the skill, the chokmah, the wisdom, to take all the little pieces and put them in place so that we can see the picture of Christ in the midst of it. Thank you, Lord. Bless your holy name. And Lord, I pray your great blessing upon each and every one that have been in here and apart and will be apart as the day goes on. To you be glory. Lord, we just give you all the praise that we can. In Jesus' name, amen. I see you there, Brother Raphael. It is good to have you here this morning. May God bless you. Listen, tomorrow I'll give you an outline for a 10 point sermon. <laughs> oh, well, what can I tell you? Uh, I know, when, 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 usually when I say, you know, I got a 10 point message for you, people roll their eyes back and go, oh, hopefully, though, you'll uh, catch on. May God bless you. Listen, each and every one of you have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day. Ah. Uh, you're very welcome, Miss Terry. You're well, very welcome. May God bless you. I love you all. Have such a great day. Serve him with gladness. Remember, enter his, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Got it rolling around in my mind. Whole bunch of scripture. May God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow morning at 9.